going to segue now for the remaining parts of the show and focus on the business side. I've received requests from people asking, hey, how is this coronavirus certainly impacting business? We've been reading a lot of information, a lot of information about businesses going out of business and people shutting down. Uh, so we're going to spend the next uh, uh, the rest of the show with two sp- very special guests at independent interviews, and starting with Mr. Uh, Mr. Pat O'Keefe, and he's the founder and CEO of Birmingham, Michigan-based O'Keefe, a financial advisory and restructuring firm, and he's a restructuring consultant. Pat O'Keefe, thanks for joining us into the conference room with Mark Esley and Dana Harvey. Good morning, or now good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon, Mark and Dana. So good, good to morning. have you. Good morning. Good, good afternoon. Good. Yeah, good. Good to have you. So we, you, you've heard the first part of the conversation. We will focus more so on, on the human side, if you will, the health and the wellness of people as we going through this coronavirus. Now, you are a restructuring expert as it relates to businesses. Kind of talk to the listeners exactly what does that mean, and then we'll segue into uh, where we currently are as a result of this virus. Fair enough, Mark. So right now, even working from home. Uh, business owners have to assess how to best preserve cash while making tough decisions on how to right-size their operation and workforce, which, you know, helps them maintain liquidity and they deal with possible supply chain disruption, which is really getting things from vendors that they count on. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, depends on how they deal with those creditors at the same time and developing financial strategies aimed at keeping the business alive. And that's what we do. We help uh, business owners figure out ways to keep their uh, businesses alive. Yeah. It used to be an interesting comment. You said the supply chain interruption. Now, let's kind of unpack that and put that in simple English for a lot of people. You know, we, we've seen this firsthand with people going to the store and the product ne- is not necessarily on the shelf. Talk to the listeners about exactly what does supply chain management mean and its importance uh, in the consumer behavioral process, or in other words, buying products? That, that's a great question, Mark, because when we talk about supply chain disruption, it really is the process from where goods leave the manufacturing floor, where they're actually made, assembled, and packaged for use by um, consumers. Then they leave that floor. They are shipped generally by truck or rail, to a destination, sometimes today with um, places like Amazon, to a distribution center where they're gathered and uh, warehoused until they're needed at the next level, which can be either a customer order um, that's online or shipped directly to the store where you see that good on the shelf. So the supply chain is, is real important. One of the other things that impacts the supply chain If you have products, and I'll use an example that require four parts, A, a B, a C, and a D, um, as a business owner, you want to make sure that all four parts show up and you may be getting them from four different places. And so, again, in terms of supply chain, you have to reach out and make sure that the people that are supplying those parts to you that uh, help in the assistance of assembling uh, whatever good that you have is going to show up. I'll give you an example. I mean, it, we hear a lot in the news about paper towels, mm-hmm. which, you know, if you look at them, they require a cardboard roll on the inside, the actual product itself wrapped around it, and it's usually stuck in a plastic package and labeled and shipped out. Well, if there were three different vendors involved with that, and somebody didn't show up with the cardboard roll on the inside, you wouldn't have much of a paper towel to deal with. Or if the plastic wasn't available to wrap it, by the time it got to the store, it could be wet or damaged in some capacity. So, I mean, that's a mm. very basic example, but all, all three of those components are essential. And we're seeing it right now firsthand with the grocery store situation where, um, you know, if you think about it, we on a, a normal day, a store is fully stocked, essentially, before this coronavirus. You can go to the store and get whatever you want. And now we've seen it. We've seen that disruption, if you will. We've seen that disruption in the grocery store industry, whether you go to Bush's or Kroger's or Myers or wherever you, wherever you do your shopping, where we're seeing people buying products, hoarding products in some situations. And please don't hoard products. Please don't do that. But we're seeing that disruption in every single day right now as it relates to the uh, grocery store industry, correct? We are. In, in part, if you think about it, in just the, the normal course, 
the stores as we're used to seeing are all generally properly stocked with plenty of goods on the shelf. But because people, as you suggested, are hoarding or stockpiling, um, not really fully understanding the length of the uncertainty that they're faced with, you can walk down many aisles in those same shopping um, centers and find, you know, empty, vacant shelves with no product on them. And so the demand for those goods has increased, uh, and as a consequence, the stores haven't been able to keep up. Uh, Meyer, for instance, had issued something out last week saying, you know, they have plenty of product, but the man hours now required to stack has gone up exponentially. So they want to reduce um, store hours so that they can have more time to stack the shelves um, in the normal course to be ready for customers who want to buy. Hmm. Dana? Yeah, I, I, I've been paying attention to that as well. Um, I am on the, um, the end of the section where I haven't been able to find these paper products, and, and I understand the mental reaction of people um, purchasing more than they than they need, but not realizing how they themselves are or can be a part of the uh, the interruption process to make sure that everybody has um, the items that they have. What other stores do you think are doing a good job of combating um, the the inventory that's not on the shelves that people need? I, and, and I thought that example of the stores taking time to reduce hours so that their staff can restock because that will help bring up inventory levels. Are there any other examples that, you, that, you, that you've seen or that they could do to help in this process? Well, a lot, I'll give you an example again with paper products. Um, most stores are stocking them, um, you know, late in the evening or early in the morning. So if you're looking for paper products, for instance, your best chance of getting them is usually first thing in the morning when the um, shelves are full. But, it, you know, it, if you look, you, you see um, soup, for instance. Any canned uh, food seems to be going off the shelves quick, too, because of the ability to store it for long periods of time. Um, what's funny is that, uh, you know, for the most part, there's plenty of vegetables. I heard Jesse and your um, other guests this morning talking about good uh, eating habits and health. Um, there still seems to be plenty of vegetables at a lot of the stores. And, uh, again, you know, those would be something that you could tap into, eat healthy, and protect yourself against viruses. Well, Pat, what I'm going to do is to take a quick break, and we come back from break for a few moments. Let's talk about restructuring a business and how entrepreneurs and businesses can prepare themselves financially on what we're going through in these unprecedented times. You are in the conference room with Mark Ashley and Dana Harvey and Mr. Pat O'Keefe, who's a restructuring expert. We're going to come back and talk about that and more right after this break on 19 a.m. and Superstation. And this show is trying to provide you with the information that you need as we think about the coronavirus and the days that lay ahead of us quite candidly. Welcome back to 19 Name and Superstation. You are in the conference room with Mark Esley and uh, Ms. Dana Harvey, and she's uh, phoning, phoning in as our co-host, and uh, she's, we're doing a social distancing. And we have on the phone Mr. Pat O'Keefe, who's a restructuring consultant slash expert. And, Pat, I want to segue in our remaining time together to talk about businesses. We know that businesses are being impacted, and there's a, there's a cash strain or a cash, uh, I guess, a cash struggle for a lot of businesses. What do you tell those businesses uh, as a restructuring expert, uh, and they're not sure what to do at this point in terms of cash, and, and they're trying to survive for, for the future longer term in these difficult times? Well, in order to really – put together a strategy to keep your business alive, you've got to do two things. One is you've got to figure out how much cash you have to work with. And that could be assessing as simple as what do you have in the bank, what is available to you in terms of lines of credit, trying to figure out what customers are likely to pay you. Do you have any opportunity to generate cash from, you know, a quick sale of some maybe non-essential assets and coming up with plans to incentivize customers to pay you at this point in time. The second part is then you got to figure out how you're going to use that cash. And so you've got to identify, you know, critical people to your operation, both in terms of vendors and labor force and, um, you know, rationalize the existing labor force that is required to meet, albeit a diminishing demand at this point in time and put together a communication strategy to 
let people know how you're going to operate going forward. So those are the two big issues, figuring out how much cash you got to work with and then projecting how you're going to use it. There's been some discussion, and Dan, I'll, I'll engage you in a sec. Uh, there's been some discussion, for example, I saw the governor of New York recently this past week, Governor Cuomo, where he's going to, I guess, recommend, or in, in maybe in the state of New York, they're going to waive mortgage payments for 90 days, right? So kind of take that pressure off of consumers. From a business standpoint, is it a good idea at this point to consider waiving you know, billing your customers, or is that something, uh, I, I mean, we know that entrepreneurs and business people need the cash, but would that, is that a good business strategy to waive those uh, those uh, bills, if you will, at this point in time, or should you work it out, you know, directly with your, your creditors, so to speak? Well, so I would encourage business owners to bill their clients um, for the simple reason that it's hard sometimes to determine who can pay and who can't pay. Um, I've had a couple of clients who are landlords who have um, apartment complexes that have been willing to waive a month's rent during this period of time or have offered, um, you know, a reduction in rent for this month, understanding that people may not be working at full levels. I think, you know, that builds goodwill. And in terms of, you know, the real estate aspect, at the end of the day, landlords want people in their buildings The courts are closed. There's no ability to evict people that can't pay. But what's the point? Um, Because you're not going to put somebody else in your building that can't pay. Everybody's in the same boat together. So I think, you know, a level of understanding to the extent that you can afford to develops goodwill with the people who depend on you. And, uh, you know, until this gets sorted out, it's probably the best. The the mortgage payment um, situation is interesting because I think uh, they're going to have to do that. The, the, the worst thing that would happen is to have aggressive, um, you know, Wall Street investment bankers who have liquidity taking advantage of people's misfortune because they can't make their mortgage payments right now, whether they own houses, apartment complexes, shopping centers, and the like. So I think a, a moratorium on both the payments and the legal process um, is is fair and just during this period of time. Um, Pat, I also had a question about uh, tough decisions that these business owners have to make, you know, in addition to the cash on hand and how you're going to spend it. What do you think um, will be some of the services, business services, that they may have to pull back on? I mean, clearly there are a, a number of essential services that businesses still need to do and, and operate, you know, identifying products. But there are some um, other departments or services that they might be able to um, pull back on to um, keep some of that cash reserve on hand. What do you think will be some of those tough decisions that these businesses will have to make to stabilize before they can recover? Well, Dana, that's a great question. So let's start with some of the basic ones, um, like utilities, for instance. Many of um, the utility companies, have uh, programs uh, if you pick up the phone and call them to stretch out your payment or defer payment. I think in any of these situations, being proactive is better than being reactive. And if um, you make a call to um, a utility company, they will um, be responsive and generally have a plan for you to uh, uh, defer your payments. And I think that's also true, you know, with bank payments and the like. If you communicate, communication is the key here when you're asking for people to, uh, you know, stand down a little bit. Um, You know, other non-essential services, you know, could be things like um, janitorial services, maybe certain supplies that you have uh, within your shop that you don't maybe need any more of and don't need to stockpile. Those would be some things. Um, uh, labor is, is another issue. Um, you know, there has been studies done in my industry that show that when faced with a, you know, potential 20 or 30 percent um, reduction in labor force, a lot of times people will um, prefer to take a 20 or 30 percent pay cut in the short run, um, knowing that it saves everybody's jobs. And, you know, so uh, employers don't necessarily have to shrink their labor force because they may find employees still want a paycheck, albeit maybe a little smaller one, 
versus the prospect of losing their job. So I think, you know, the whole process, there's no sacred cows. I think you have to look at everything and um, communicate. And nobody is going to criticize you for doing what you're capable of. And so I think the biggest issue is trying to figure out what you are capable of doing, you know, with your cash flow and then communicating it to everybody. Well, Pat, I, I got to tell you, <clears throat> good information because we're going to continue the conversation shortly with uh, the district director from uh, the Small Business Administration, the SBA. But before you go, can you give the listeners your website and contact information where they can get more information? Because you're, you're giving some great information as it relates to liquidity and who you need to talk to as we're going through these challenging times from a business standpoint. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, you can go to uh, – O'KeefeLLC.com, so that's O-K-E-E-F-E-L-L-C.com. And I would let your listeners know that uh, this Wednesday at uh, noon, we are hosting a uh, webinar with uh, the uh, legal firm Butzel to talk about the practical and and legal aspects of restructuring strategies in a financial crisis. Mm. And this is going to be geared, um, you know, to small business owners who are faced with a lot of uncertainty, and we hope in a quick hour to give them a lot of information they need. I'm assuming it's going to be a webinar now, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah. It yeah. is. All right. Here you go. And, and, Pat O'Keefe, I want to thank you very much for joining us in the conference room today with uh, Dana Harvey and, and Mark Kessley. We appreciate this great information. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Have a great day, Mark and Dana. Thank you.